Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. And this is your first lecture for anatomy and physiology. So in class, I asked some of you, what's anatomy mean? What's physiology mean? So anatomy, you want to think structure and physiology, you want to think function. And down here, I have in red, I have the structure is related to the function and the function is related to the structure and I cannot use that pointer right. So I just wanted you to see where I'm at. So form meets function. So an organ is put together a certain way to allow there to be a specific function. All right. Anatomy structures, what are they made of? Where are they located? What uh, other structures might be associated with them? Physiology, functions. Functions of those structures um, both individually and cooperatively. Uh, the functions cooperate with one another throughout the different systems. So in this class, we'll look at the microscopic anatomy and the macroscopic. Microscopic is gonna be small. So looking at cells and molecules, macroscopic is gonna be large. So we'll look at gross anatomy. So the actual, like in college, I took a gross lab anatomy and that's a cadaver lab. So cytology and histology are microscopic pieces of anatomy. So logi means study of, cyto refers to cells and histo is referring to tissues. So we're not gonna have time to do the tissue unit. It's a difficult unit, but we will touch on all of the tissues and you know, pathologists are doctors that study tissues. And you can, if you really like anatomy, uh, I saw there's a job out there when I went to something the last spring that you can be a pathology assistant and you're the one that studies the biopsy. So if something might be wrong, maybe breast tissue uh, or someone's having, someone might potentially have a disease, they might take the tissue and prepare the tissue and the uh, pathologist will compare the, you know, normal tissue to tissue that might have disease. It could be cancer. So, I mean, so something as simple as skin cancer, like with a mole being removed, taking a biopsy. Human physiology uh, has different levels, cellular, organ, systemic, pathological. So, looking at uh, cells, looking at how the cells function, organ, how the organs function, organ systems, how they function, pathological, again, looking at the disease, diseases by studying the tissues. So a couple things I wanna get you used to in this class are a sign or a symptom. And these are tricky uh, to kids, like aren't they the same thing? Uh, they, they are hard to distinguish, but something easy is like, if we look at the examples here, signs such as a fever, symptoms such as tiredness. Well, fever, we have a number for that, right? So signs are generally like if you get your blood work done and you know what the normal level is, but it's elevated or it's low or your blood pressure is high or low, or you have a fever and everybody's getting their fever checked these days because of COVID. Symptoms you know, I'm achy, I'm tired, I have a stomach ache. So signs are more quantitative where there's some type of value or number and symptoms are more qualitative based on the quality of the light, of the, um, the patient, when we're talking anatomically, the quality, you know, what it's, it's more subjective, how do they feel? And a doctor does the scientific method that you learn in science class, you know, you've been learning this forever, they use it all the time. They observe the patient, they come up with a hypothesis, they collect data, they collect all those quantitative measurements, blood work numbers, et cetera. And then they analyze everything before making a diagnosis. There's different levels of organization that you need to be familiar with. And so we're gonna go small, the chemical level to the organ level. 
So I'm going to skip to the pictures, but you could pause the video here and write down some definitions. And I hope that you are, you know, making note of the terms that we're talking about and your vocab list so that this is helpful for you. So I'm going to skip these, but you can pause the video and go through these. I'm going to get to the picture. So this shows you a bunch of atoms are making up, this is the chemical level, molecules. So here's a complex protein molecule. And then here's the filaments. Um, you know, these molecules make up protein filaments. And those filaments make up, you can see the pink and the uh, purple here. That's the pink and the purple here. So a bunch of these make up um, cells, muscle cells. And then those muscle cells and their heart muscle cells, when you put a bunch of them together, so now I see a bunch of them, that is cardiac muscle tissue. And cardiac muscle tissue is what makes up a heart. So the tissues get put together and that makes up the organ. And then you take several organs and you put them together and that makes up a system. So this would be like the cardiovascular system, which is made up of the blood vessels and the heart. And then if you take several systems, so this is just showing you the cardiovascular system and put them together, that makes up an organism. So you have your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, your nervous system, your digestive system, your urinary system. You see all these different systems here. Now, I just want to talk briefly about the different systems in the body that we're going to talk about. You generally should meet, you should know being in this class, what are the major organs associated with each of these systems? So we will cover the integumentary system. So you might say, huh, what's that? Well, integument is referring to the skin. So the major organs, skin, hair, sweat glands, um, and nails. So after homeostasis, our introductory chapter here, we do get into the integumentary system. And then there's the skeletal system the muscular system, we do these first semester, nervous system we do, endocrine we do, don't have time for, but it is extremely important and hormones control your development uh, in lots of stages in your life. So it ultimately controls you, the brain ultimately controls everything in the nervous system, but then the endocrine system. We cover the cardiovascular system, The lymphatic system is an important part of your immune system, which we need very much right now. And this, this system uh, we don't get to, but we will bring this up when appropriate. Respiratory system, the respiratory system we talk about in this class and we discuss digestive, yes. Urinary and, and the reproductive systems, we do not. All right, so we kind of skip in the book. We went to 1-7 uh, here. So again, you can look at the PowerPoint and what the sections are that are covered so you know how to do the reading. And homeostasis is the next topic. So homeostasis is maintaining a constant internal environment, uh, which is auto-regulated, um, meaning it automatically happens, and also our bodies respond through our nervous and endocrine system. So that's an extrinsic regulation. So if this is homeostasis, we're maintaining homeostasis regardless of what's happening external. So if the stimulus goes up, our body's able to bring it back to a set point. If it goes down, our body's able to bring it back to a set point. So maintaining a constant internal environment regardless of any external forces. So how does it work? Homeostasis, the regulatory mechanism works by three components. There's a receptor, a control center, and an effector. And the receptor is what receives the stimulus. Okay, so there's receptors throughout your body, maybe pain receptors, uh, you touch something, so it receives the stimulus and then it goes to the control center. And the control center then, the control center is ultimately usually the brain, most always, and that processes the signal and then sends instructions to the effector. So the effector is going to be either a muscle 
or a gland. And the effector is going to carry out those instructions. So it might be moving my hand or something like that. By having this mechanism, there's less fluctuations and the conditions are kept close to a set point. Here is a diagram that you should be able to understand. And what I want you to do is make sure you read through this. I'm gonna explain it. If you don't, just pause and go back through it. So the classic example is a thermostat, okay? In your house, you have your thermostat set at a certain temperature. Let's say, you know, it's, it's today and it's really hot out and all of a sudden you decide to have all these people come over your house, but you're not going to because COVID is going on and we cannot do that right now, right? And anyway, the temperature goes up, all right? So you can see this graph right here. There's the normal range in purple. Here's the set point, all right? So the temperature goes up, okay? The receptors, the thermometer, okay, sense this and send the stimulus to the control center, which is the thermostat. The thermostat tells the air conditioner, which in this example is the effector, okay, to cool the house down and it brings it to a set point. So we're like here, okay, the stimulus was the temperature got raised, okay, the brain receives it, has the air conditioner bring it down to a set point. That is an example of negative feedback. Okay, the response of the effector negates the stimulus. So the stimulus went up here, the temperature went high. The, the effector was the air conditioner. It brought the temperature back down to that normal point. All right, an example is body temperature of this negative feedback. So here you can see that, let's go where your body temperature increases. Now you're outside, you're not in the house. Maybe you're going for a jog, okay, you're, or you're just outside. Your body temperature, you get hot, all right? So body temperature goes up. Message, that's the, the receptors detect this. Body temperature goes up. Brain detects the te body temperature is increasing. It sends it to the effectors, which are blood vessels, your sweat glands. It causes the blood flow to increase and it causes you to sweat. And then that brings it back to a set point. So temperature up. Brain sends a message to blood vessels, sweat glands, bring it back down, maintain homeostasis. At the bottom, at the bottom here, it's your temperature goes down, okay? Receptors sense this, they send it to the brain. The brain sends it to the effectors, which are your blood vessels, your sweat gland, and actually your skeletal muscles. And what happens is you shiver, you decrease your sweating, and it constricts the blood vessels and you go back to a set point. All right, this is negative feedback, okay? The effectors are gonna negate the stimulus. So the stimulus is here, the effectors negate it, they're gonna bring it back to a set point. Positive feedback, positive feedback, more produces more. All right, the initial stimulus produces a response that even amplifies it anymore. So in negative, we were here and we went like this. Here's the stimulus, this happens, okay? The body's moved away from homeostasis. The normal range is not maintained, all right? But then if it's positive, by doing this, um, it, it's not a long time. It completes this dangerous loop in order to hurry up and bring it back to a homeostasis. And so it's quick, but it's more, produces more. And I want you to pause the video and I want you to go through these steps. You can also go in your textbook and I want you to go through these steps and I want you to read. And then I would like you to also watch this video. And then you'll see that there's um, gonna be a couple questions for you. But in general, if you think about positive feedback, like I could tell you, um, if a baby, a baby, it's innate for them to be able to suck when they're born, okay? And that's so that they can breastfeed. And so they are able to latch on and the sucking creates a release, release of milk. 
the more they suck, the more milk that gets produced, right? Or when fruit starts to ripen, one apple starts to ripen, they release gas, more ethylene gas produces more ethylene gas. And so that's positive feedback. Uh, the example you're going to look at is the blood clotting. And so everyone's blood, okay, you start to bleed, and somehow you put pressure on your cut, and eventually it stops. So that's how it goes back to equilibrium. So you just got to, I want you to work through that example and figure out how that works. Positive and negative feedback. Uh, both of the systems work together to maintain, maintain homeostasis. It's dynamic. Uh, it's a dynamic state of equilibrium. There's continual, continual adaptations that our bodies have that keep us alive. This bottom bullet here is basically when that's not happening. Okay, so physiologically, when our systems are not able to keep this balance, this homeostasis, that results in disease. Sometimes medications do the work for our bodies, uh, surgeries. Um, that's how it's dealt with exercise or people just change their lifestyles. Okay, that is the first lecture, everybody.